Welcome, everyone, to our Bible study. We're so glad that you're here with us and you've chosen to be a part of this time together. Appreciate you uh, joining in with us. If you want to take your Bibles and go ahead and open to the book of Acts, we're going to start in Acts chapter 21 and verses 20 and 21. We'll read there in just a moment as we get into our study. But again, we appreciate you being here and thank you for joining in with us for this period of, uh, of Bible study. <clears throat> Before we get started, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll uh, get into our study and talk about the churches of Galatia. Our most kind and gracious Father in heaven, we're so thankful to you for this day of life and for the many blessings of it, especially for the opportunity that we have to study together from thy word. We pray that you'll bless us as we do so, that as we look into thy word, that we'll uh, have hearts that are open to thy truth, that we may learn things that, uh, of course, are true to thy word, but things that will strengthen our faith and our knowledge of thee, that will strengthen our knowledge of thy will for us that will motivate and encourage us to live lives of faithful and dedicated service unto you. We're so thankful that you've given us your word that we can read and study and learn of you and your great love for us. We're thankful for the manifestation of that love and the sending of thy son Jesus and his life that he lived, his death that he died upon the cross, the shedding of his blood that gives us the forgiveness of our sins. We're thankful for his resurrection from the dead that gives us the hope of life beyond the grave. And we're thankful for his ascension back to thy right hand and the hope that that gives us of eternal life with thee in heaven. We're so thankful for him. We pray for forgiveness of sins. Pray that we'll ever remember his great example and sacrifice and always seek to live in a way that will honor and glorify him in our lives here. We're thankful for the church that was purchased with his blood and that we can learn thy truth and be members of it and enjoy fellowship with one another and with thee, that we can have all spiritual blessings in Christ and that we can know and and have the assurance of living with thee forever in heaven. Pray that you'll bless the church throughout the world, bless us as a congregation here, that we all may strive to know thy will and to teach it to others and to live it in our lives that we may be an example and a light shining in the world round about us. We pray for our world. We know there's much turmoil in it, and we pray for our nation, that it may be blessed with peace. Pray for the leaders of our country, that they will be uh, blessed with protection, and that you'll bless them with wisdom, that the decisions that are made will be such that we may continue to have the freedoms that we enjoy to, to be able to assemble and to worship Thee and to teach Thy truth without fear. We pray that you'll uh, watch over our leaders and those who are in uh, harm's way, the those who are... Uh, Uh, the ones who risk their lives to protect us and to defend us, uh, emergency workers and our military and uh, all those who are willing to make those tremendous sacrifices. We pray that you'll bless them, and we pray that there may be peace in our land and even throughout the world. We pray that forces of good will triumph over evil and that the light of thy truth may, of course, uh, win in the end, as we know it will, but that many will decide to be on the side of right rather than the side of darkness. We're so thankful for, again, thy word and for the opportunity we have to study it and pray you'll bless us as we do so, that we'll study and learn things that will strengthen us and motivate us to serve thee faithfully, and we can look forward to that eternal home with thee in heaven. Again, we're thankful for Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. So we're going to study about the churches of Galatia in this lesson, and this is part of a series that we've begun talking about churches of the New Testament. And uh, as we we try to mention when we start these lessons that when the Bible talks about churches, for example, in Romans 16, 16, where Paul uh, said the churches of Christ salute you, we understand that he wasn't talking about different denominations. He was talking about different congregations, but they're all part of the same church. Jesus only built one church. He only has one church, and that church is his body. So it's the church that follows the head. That is, we do what Jesus teaches and commands as it's revealed in his new covenant, the gospel. So churches of Christ has to do with individual autonomous congregations that were in different locations in different parts of the world. So one church, yet individual congregations. And so understanding that, we've looked at so far the church at Jerusalem, and then we talked about the church at Antioch. Well, this lesson we're going to talk about the churches, plural, of Galatia. 
And so there are a couple of things to think about uh, in connection with that. The first is that when we think about the churches of Galatia, we need to talk about just briefly the region of Galatia and, and what that is. So Galatia, uh, you know, we, we think about Jerusalem, we think about Antioch, we understand that those were, were cities. And so there was a congregation in that city, and so it was the church of that city, whatever the city name was. Well, Galatia is not a city, but it's a a region. So in our way of, of thinking uh, here in America, we have cities, but they're, they are parts of a region of, of territory that we call a county. So we live in Marion County, Alabama. And in Marion County, there are various different towns and cities. And so there would be several churches of Marion, uh, but they would be individual congregations in individual towns, but located in the broader, broader region known as Marion County. Well, that's how it is with Galatia. Galatia was a, a it, it was several districts really that were kind of south and southwest of the historical kingdom of Galatia. So what had happened in, in Paul's time, of course, is that Galatia, this this region, had become part of the Roman Empire, and it was basically a Roman province. So when Paul writes to the churches of Galatia, he's writing to an entire region, not just to one city. Now, there were several cities that were located in Galatia. There was Antioch of Pisidia. Now, in our last lesson, we talked about the church at Antioch, but this was a different Antioch. That was Antioch of Syria, which was down, you know, just just north of the land of Canaan. This is Antioch of Pisidia, which is further north and then to the west of of that Antioch and uh, in the region of Galatia. Galatia is in what today is the country of Turkey. So Asia Minor, we call it sometimes. Uh, And so there was another town named Antioch. And we designated it, designate it as Antioch of Pisidia to distinguish from the other Antioch, which became kind of Paul's base of operations. But there were other cities as well. There was Iconium, Lystra, Derby, and all these places we read about as Paul went on his missionary trips. So, in fact, when when Paul went on those evangelistic uh, trips, which sometimes call missionary journeys, on all three of them. He visited the region of Galatia. So the first missionary journey is Acts 13, 2 through 14, 7. And we read about Paul going to places like Derby and Lystra and Iconium, preaching the gospel and establishing congregations there. Second missionary journey, Acts 15, 36 and 16, 1 through 6. He went back to those same places and edified and built up congregations while still evangelizing. So he went back to Galatia. And then on the third missionary journey, he also went back to the region of Galatia, Acts 18.23. So when Paul is writing to the churches of Galatia, he's writing to several different congregations in different cities, but in the region known as Galatia. So we need to understand that and keep that in mind as as we study and as we talk about the churches of, of Galatia. Now, in order to really understand what the Bible has to say to the churches of Galatia, and especially in the book of Galatians, we need to take just a few moments and and review what we've learned about the church at Jerusalem and the church at Antioch, and then learn an important part of the history of those two congregations. So let's do that briefly. First of all, let's talk about the church at Jerusalem. Now, because of its location in Jerusalem, obviously, and because of the circumstances of its establishment, the church at Jerusalem primarily consisted of Jews. Okay? We understand that. Jerusalem was the heart of Judaism. It was their their main city. Uh, it, of course, is where the temple was located. It's the city where Jews from all of the all over the world came to on the feast days, Passover and Pentecost and and tabernacles. And so they made journeys to Jerusalem. So it was a a town inhabited by Jewish people. 
and a town which was visited by Jewish people. So on the day of Pentecost, when the church was established, there were Jews from all over the Roman Empire, all over the known world, who were there in the city of Jerusalem. And they were the ones who heard the gospel and believed it and obeyed it and became Christians. About 3,000 of them on that first Pentecost, that first day, and then the church grew there. And as it grew there, it was made up of Jews. So when we think of the church at Jerusalem, we understand that they are Christians now, but they come from a Jewish background. Now, something happened here, and, and that was the, the fact that some of these Jews who became Christians found it very difficult to let go of the law of Moses and to let go of Judaism. And I think we can understand that from their background and from how they'd been brought up in it and everything they'd been taught about it and how it was, in fact, the law of God until Christ came and established his new covenant. So we can kind of understand why it might be difficult to let go of some of those things. But if you still have your Bibles open, we're going to read here in Acts 21, verses 20 and 21. In fact, we're going to back up just a little bit to uh, verse 18 and read down through verse 21 and, and notice this example and what we, we learn here about this tendency to want to hold on to the old law by Jews who became Christians. So here's what the Bible says, Acts 21, 19. 18 rather. And the day following Paul went in with us uh, with us unto James and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Now, Paul has been out on these missionary evangelistic efforts, preaching and teaching the gospel. He's been preaching to Jews and to Gentiles, and he's been teaching them that the law of Moses has ended which is right, and it's true. So he comes back to Jerusalem, and he's reporting to the congregation there about what happened. Well, in fact, he's talking to James and to the elders of the congregation. And he tells them all these wonderful things God had done for the Gentiles. And the Bible says when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. They were glad that Gentiles were believing and obeying the gospel and being saved from their sins. But then they say, the, you, you see, Paul, brother, they call him, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. So that's great that Gentiles are becoming Christians, but there are thousands of Jews who have become Christians, and they are zealous of the law, which means they have a burning desire toward the law of Moses, and this is what they hear about you. We've been informed We've heard that you're teaching the Jews who are out there among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. You're teaching them not to circumcise their children, not to keep the customs of the law of Moses. And they go on to tell Paul that if you want to be accepted here in Jerusalem, you're going to have to show a little more uh, love for the law of Moses, and they want him to help some who are taking a vow and him take a vow and all these all these things. And it, that's another story. But the point is, it demonstrates that there was a strong influence of Jewish Christians to hold on to the law of Moses. And those who were holding on to it had become a strong influence in the church, particularly the church at Jerusalem. And they wanted Paul to kind of tone down that message uh, when he was there among the Jews. So keep that in mind. It's an important thing to understand that happened in the early church. Now, there were some who went even further, and they had difficulty in accepting Gentiles as brothers in Christ, and especially if they were not circumcised. So as a result of these attitudes among 
members of the church at Jerusalem, a, a faction or a party began to develop that is known as Judaizers. And so we talk about sometimes the Judaizers or Judaizing Christians. These were Christians who taught that keeping the law of Moses was a part of the gospel of Christ, especially the act of circumcision. Now, go back with me to Acts chapter 15, and uh, we're going to read verse 1, and then we're going to come back to this chapter and notice several things here. But in verse 1, the Bible says that certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. So understand that. They're saying, yes, we want Gentiles to become Christians, and we're glad the gospel's going to them and it's bring, being preached to them, but it's not enough to hear and believe and obey the gospel you also have to be circumcised to be saved and, of course, to be accepted by these Jewish Christians. If you look down at verse 5, it says, There rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So there were some who also taught, that this principle of circumcision had to be bound upon all Gentiles who wanted to become Christians. And notice that these were Pharisees who believed. Now, we learn a lot about the Pharisees as we study the New Testament and the gospel accounts. Jesus confronted them over and over again in his time on the earth. They were known for their holding to the law of Moses, but more particularly holding to their opinions and and traditions about the law of Moses rather than what God actually said in his law. They elevated their doctrines and opinions above even what the law actually said. They were known for their legalism. They were known for their self-righteousness, and most of them rejected Jesus. Well, now you have some who have come to understand that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and the Savior of the world, and they've become Christians, but it's hard to let go of those deep-rooted beliefs and opinions and traditions that they had as Pharisees. And so they're saying, yes, you Gentiles can become a Christian, and you have to do what God says to be a Christian, but you also have to do what we say. You have to do what the law of Moses says. You have to be circumcised and you have to keep the law. Now, what happened is that group of Christians, that uh, faction that arose in the church at Jerusalem, became very vocal and very adamant in their false teaching. And make no mistake, it is false teaching. It's not true at all. And we're going to see that in just a moment. But they became very vocal about it. And because of that, the great unity that existed in the church at Jerusalem that we studied about a couple of lessons ago and how these brethren you know, were selling what they had to help one another, how they were working together and loving each other and all of those things, that unity is threatened because now you have a group that says, you know, what we were taught at first, that was only part of the story. We have to add this to it. And so you have some who want to just hold to the truth, and now this group that wants to add circumcision, add keeping the law of Moses to it. And so the unity there is threatened. But not only is the unity threatened among the Christians at Jerusalem, but now it begins to be threatened, the unity that existed between the church at Jerusalem and other churches. So let's talk secondly about the church at Antioch. Just a brief review. And of course, this is the church, the congregation that we talked about and studied about in our last lesson. So the church at Antioch, it's the first church that, according to the record of Scripture, the first congregation that had a great number of Gentile converts. So we read about that in Acts 11, 20, and 21, that after Peter preached at the house of Cornelius, God opened the door to the Gentiles, and those who were in 
Antioch began preaching to the Gentiles, and many of them became Christians. So as a result, the circumcision faction from Jerusalem soon paid a visit to the church at Antioch to try to force their doctrine, their false doctrine, upon them. So we were reading in Acts 15 and verse 1, and I want you to notice it again that when you back up into chapter 14 and verse 26, it says, Thence sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. So we're in Antioch where this congregation exists, where Paul had left out from, and now he's come back to. And certain men, chapter 15, verse 1, which came down from Judea, taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Where did they teach that? In Antioch. Where did they come from? Judea, Jerusalem. So certain brethren came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And when it says came down, they went north, but it's downhill because Jerusalem's on the top of a mountain. But they came to Antioch and they began to preach this doctrine, false doctrine, about circumcision. Now notice verse 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. So what happened when these false teachers came to Antioch? They ran headlong into the apostle Paul. And Paul said, we're not going to have that here. That's not the gospel. The gospel doesn't teach you have to be circumcised to be saved. The gospel doesn't teach you have to keep the law of Moses to be saved. And you're not going to come here and teach that. And so there was a dissension and disputation. And the Bible says no small dissension and disputation. Well, if it was not small, that means it was big. They had a big argument, big discussion about this because Paul would not stand for that kind of error being taught in the church, binding the law of Moses on Christians, Jewish or Gentile. And so he rebuked them. And so they said, well, let's, let's go back to Jerusalem and let's gather all the apostles and the elders of the church at Jerusalem and, and let's discuss this. So that's what they did. But here's what we need to notice. What started in Jerusalem and threatened the unity of that congregation then spread to Antioch. So Christians from Jerusalem who were in fellowship with Christians in Antioch now are coming to Antioch and saying that what you did previously to, to become Christians is not good enough. And so we had fellowship, but now we've come to the conclusion that you have to also be circumcised and also keep the law of Moses. And if you don't do that, then you're not really saved. You're not really Christians. And so it's threatening the unity of the church at Antioch because there were members of that congregation who would be persuaded by that error and it would split that church. And it's threatening the unity that existed between Jerusalem and Antioch, that these two congregations might be separated from one another. It's a division over this terrible, false doctrine. So that's a review, briefly, of Jerusalem and Antioch and how this error that arose in Jerusalem began to affect the church at Antioch. Now, just real briefly, I want us to talk about this conflict between Jerusalem and Antioch and read what happened in Acts chapter 15. And then we're going to go to the book of Galatians and talk about how this all related to the churches of Galatia. So in Acts 15, we have the record of the meeting in Jerusalem of the apostles and the elders of the church at Jerusalem to deal with this false doctrine of the Judaizers. So, Starting in verse number six, the Bible says the apostles and elders came together for to uh, consider of this matter. So they've all come together. We're going to we're going to discuss it. And keep in mind, by the way, that when the apostles are gathered together to discuss a matter, it's not a matter of opinion. It's not that we're going to listen to the opinion of the apostles, and if we like it, we'll agree with it, and if we don't, we won't. These are the ambassadors of Christ. 
They are the ones inspired of God, given this unique position of authority in the early church. So when Paul and Peter and and the apostles speak, they are speaking the will of God, and there's no discussion about it. So they're not coming together to say, we're going to put our heads together. You know, we're going to have a conference and we're going to hash this out and have a majority rule opinion. These are the apostles of Christ and they're going to lay down the law. And that's, that's what happens here. Um, and so just keep that in mind as, as we read through the text here, that sometimes people use this as, as justification for churches today to have conferences and to get together and decide matters of doctrine. We don't have the right to do that. There are none of us qualified to decide matters of doctrine. This book decides matters of doctrine. It's what the Bible says, nothing more, nothing less. And that was the whole problem here. People didn't want any more just what the Lord said. They wanted to add their beliefs to it. And that's where we get into trouble. But let's read, starting in verse number 7, what Peter said uh, when they came together. The Bible says, When there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. So Peter says, we remember what happened. God sent me to the house of Cornelius. And when I got there, the uh, Holy Spirit was, the power of the Holy Spirit was given to them as evidence to to Peter and to the other Jews who were with him, that God accepted the Gentiles. And so Peter preached the gospel to them. They believed it and they obeyed it and they became Christians. And by the way, the gospel that Peter preached to them at the house of Cornelius was the same gospel that he preached on the day of Pentecost. It wasn't two different messages. It was repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He preached to Cornelius' household that they also needed to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And that's why the Bible tells us that that's what they did. They were baptized. And that's how they became Christians. God doesn't have two plans of salvation. There's only one. And it was the same for the Jews as for the Gentiles. And that's exactly what Peter is saying here. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Now, verse 10, he says, Therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. So he says, God taught you Jews what to do to be saved. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and then live a faithful life. He taught you to do that, and that's what you did. He taught the same thing to the Gentiles. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, live a faithful life. And that's what they did, and they became saved. He says, how dare we tempt God by binding something upon them for salvation that God himself has not bound upon them. God never commanded circumcision for salvation. God didn't command to keep the law of Moses to be saved. His plan of salvation is simple, and it's what Peter had preached both to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And he says, why would we put this yoke upon them? Uh, We, our fathers and, and, and us, we couldn't even... Uh, bear the burden of the law of Moses. Why do we want to put that on people when Christ came to free us from that? And then he says, we believe through the grace of God that they shall be saved even as we shall be saved even as they through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice we shall be saved even as they. We and they have the same plan of salvation. We're saved from our sins the same way they're saved from their sins. And by the way, that's what the book of Romans is all about. God's gospel, the gospel of Christ, it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to the Gentile. It's the only way to be saved. And so you can't bind these other things to it. So Peter defends the truth by reminding them of what he preached to the Gentiles at the house of Cornelius. Now notice verse number 12. 
Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. So Paul and Barnabas stand up and they defend the truth. And they do so by informing them and reminding them of what God had done among the Gentiles while they were there preaching the gospel. And notice, he says, what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. So God sent them to preach the gospel and to confirm it with miracles. So when they preached and then they worked miracles that demonstrated what they said came from the, from the power of God, it was sealed by his authority through these miracles. Paul's making the point that not once did we preach circumcision. Not once did we preach keeping the law of Moses. Yet God approved of what we preached and he verified it by miracle. How can you now say that we need to change the gospel message and add circumcision or or whatever else to it? That's not what God said, and that's not what God approved of. So now we pick up in verse 13, and we hear the words uh, words of, of James. So the Bible says, and James, I'm sorry, after they held their peace, James answered saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, which is Simon, Peter, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, and to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Now notice this verse. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. James says, James defends the truth, and he does so by quoting Old Testament prophecy. He said a long time ago, God prophesied that the Gentiles would be saved just as the Jews, and that they would all be part of one family, one kingdom. And by the way, you notice this prophecy that he quotes is the prophecy about building again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. That's not a prophecy about Jesus coming back and rebuilding a temple in Jerusalem. James says that's what God did when he built the church. And when he brought the Gentiles into it, the church is the tabernacle of David. It is the temple of God. We don't need him to come back to build another physical temple on the earth. We are his temple. When he comes back, it's not to build a temple, but it's to take the temple, the family, the church, to eternity, to heaven, to be with him forever. But nevertheless, James says the Old Testament prophecies show that God always intended to include the Gentiles, and that's exactly what happened. And when he says, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world, it means God knows what he's doing. And if God has brought the Gentiles into the church without preaching circumcision or keeping the law of Moses, then that's because that's what he intended. Who are we to change it? So, salvation is for all Jew and Gentile. So the meeting concludes with them deciding to send letters to these other congregations and to inform them about the errors of these Judaizing teachers. So notice just a couple of verses. Verse 19, James says, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Notice, he says that we trouble not them. That means that what the Judaizing teachers were doing, teaching something that was different from the gospel, was causing trouble. It was troubling the church at Jerusalem. It was troubling the church at Antioch. It was troubling the churches of Galatia. And we need to remember that, that false doctrine troubles the church. It doesn't strengthen it. It doesn't help it. It doesn't make it better. It troubles it. And when there's trouble in the church, oftentimes the false teacher will try to blame everyone but himself. And he'll say, you're the cause of trouble. If you would just go along with my error, then then everything would be okay. If we could just agree to disagree, then there wouldn't be any turmoil. Why are you causing trouble? No, the false teacher is the one who troubles the church. And James says, we're not going to do that. We're not going to trouble these congregations with this error. So he says, but that we write unto them 
that they abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. And then, if you skip down to uh, verse 22, it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. And then we have the record of their letter, uh, which is the first New Testament epistle. So it says, and I'm going to read the whole thing. Well, let's just read the end of, of verse 23 and 24. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. So notice, he says, these, the church says, these men who have come to you and taught this doctrine, they came from us, but we didn't send them. They came from the church at Jerusalem, but not with our authority. They came teaching their own doctrines, their own opinions, and they have troubled you with words, subverting your souls. Again, this is what false doctrine does. It troubles the saved, causes them to to question what they believed and what they've obeyed, causes them to question their salvation. It troubles them. It brings trouble in the church, and it subverts souls. Because if someone believes what these Judaizers are teaching, they will leave the truth of the gospel to follow this error, and their souls will be lost. The salvation of their soul is at stake. And so that's why they're writing to them to tell them, this is not the truth, and you shouldn't listen to it, and you shouldn't follow it. And so he says, we've sent this letter, we've sent Paul and Barnabas, we've sent men from the congregation with them to verify that this letter is authentic and that what we're telling you is the truth, and you don't have to keep the law of Moses. God never taught that, and and that's what they do in delivering this, this letter to them. So they tell them that these Judaizing teachers are teaching error. Okay, so we've talked about the church at Jerusalem and how this trouble arose there. We've talked about the church at Antioch, and now we've seen the conflict between these two congregations because of this error. Now let's talk about the churches of Galatia. So let's go to the book of Galatians. We're going to go to Galatians chapter 1, first of all, verses 6 through 9. And we want to talk about four threats that the churches of Galatia faced and how it relates to particularly to uh, this error. That was being taught by the Judaizing teachers. So first of all, there's the threat of false doctrine. Okay, so Galatians 1 verse 6 beginning, the Bible says, Paul writing to them says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So Paul writes to this congregation in Galatia, and he's writing about the very same error that had come from Jerusalem to Antioch. And now we see that it's made it all the way up to these churches, these congregations in Galatia. What do we learn? We learn about the threat of false doctrine. False doctrine is not content to stay in one place. Those who teach error, if they are opposed, if they are rejected, if they are not accepted or believed in one congregation, in one place, they will go to another and try to teach their error again. If they don't repent, occasionally, you know, there are those who will see the error of their ways and admit they're wrong and, and repent. And that's always the hope. But sometimes, most times, they don't. They'll just go somewhere else to teach it. That's why one of the principles of, of Scripture in the New Testament is uh, withdrawal of fellowship. And acknowledging that and letting other congregations know this person who's coming to you, uh, he doesn't come with our blessing. He's a false teacher. We let each other know. 
Okay? So false doctrine is not content to stay in one place. It went to Antioch, and now it's among the churches of Galatia. As it came to Galatia, it threatened these brethren with very serious consequences. Notice what Paul says. First of all, he says, I marvel, I'm amazed, I'm astounded that you are so quickly removing, being removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. So they, it hadn't been that long since they had first heard and believed and obeyed the gospel. And Paul says, I'm amazed that you're already leaving that for this error, that you've let someone... Paul says, I was there, I preached to you, I proved, confirmed what I was preaching by miracle. And he'll even go on to talk about in the book how he had imparted unto them the ability to work miracles. And he says, I did all these things and you knew it was the truth. And now this false teacher comes along and you're already letting him turn you away. I'm amazed at that. And he says that they were being turned, removed from him that called called you in the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And then he says, which is not another. And we need to understand that. The false teacher doesn't come along and say, I'm going to preach something to you, but it's not the gospel of Christ. He doesn't come and say, I'm I'm glad to stand before you today for this sermon, and I'm going to preach error. He doesn't tell you that. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing, right? So he wants to present it as the truth and to say that this is the gospel. So he calls it the gospel, but it's not in harmony with the gospel. So it's another gospel, which is really not the gospel at all. And that's what Paul's saying. They may call it the gospel, but it's different. if it's different from what God has said, it's not the gospel. So he says, even, Paul says, even me, if I come back to Galatia and I preach something to you different than what I preached to you previously, don't believe it. He says, if an angel from heaven comes down and tells you something different from the gospel that you've already heard and that was confirmed with miracle and for us today is recorded in this book, if it's different from what this book says, don't believe it. He says, let him be accursed. That means to be cut off from God. Now, friends, if an angel who teaches something different from the Bible is cut off from God, what about a man who teaches something different from what the Bible says. No matter how nice he may dress, no matter how friendly he is, no matter how much he may smile while he's in the pulpit, no matter what a winning personality he has, if he's telling you something different from what the Bible says, the Bible says he is accursed. He's cut off from God. And that's the terrible threat of false doctrine. So Paul says to the Galatians, don't listen to it. Don't believe it. Don't buy into it. Don't let it cause you to be removed, to be separated from the truth and from Christ. He says, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. So that's the threat of false doctrine. If the one who preaches it is accursed, And remember that these were Christians. They had heard and believed and obeyed the gospel. They were Pharisees who believed. They were Jews who believed. They became Christians, but they've abandoned the truth for their doctrines and opinions. And Paul says, let them be accursed. Now, if they abandon the truth for those opinions and that causes them to be accursed, What about the person who hears their false doctrine, believes it, and because of it abandons the gospel? Well, they're accursed too. And that's the serious consequence of false doctrine. It threatened these brethren with condemnation. Remember, Paul said they trouble you. They subvert your souls. They can cause you to be lost. So that's the first threat that they face. Secondly, they face the threat of compromise. Now, The Judaizing teachers seemed to be emphasizing circumcision above everything else. And there were some other things, but primarily it it seems to have to have to do with um, circumcision. And so someone might say, well, you know, the Old Testament did talk uh, talk about circumcision and, and it did teach it. 
And, you know, these are, are pretty good people, and, and they're, they're trying to do what they think is right. And so why don't we just go along with them? Okay, they, they just want us to be circumcised, so let's just do that. And that will appease them, and then there will be harmony in the congregation, and everything will be fine. That's the threat, the threat of compromise. And here's the threat. Here's the problem. Compromise in one area soon leads to compromise in any and all areas. Notice with me in the book of Colossians. We're going to come back to Galatians, but I want to read just real quick from Colossians 2 and verse uh, 18. First of all, verse 8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. It's that simple. If it's not from Christ, then it will spoil you. And the idea is of milk that spoils. It goes bad. It's not good anymore. It's poisoned. It's rotten. It's disgusting. So philosophy, wisdom of men, vain deceit, things that may appeal, but they're empty and they're not true. Traditions of men, rudiments of the world, they come from fleshly motivation. Don't let those things spoil you from Christ. And then verse 18, he says, let no man beguile you deceive you out of, trick you out of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and in neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. What does Paul say? He says, don't let anyone deceive you, cause you to be spoiled through man's teachings, and don't let anyone deceive you, beguile you of your reward by their false doctrine. And he says it may sound good. It may be appealing to you. And it may even look like humility and a show of wisdom, but it's only human wisdom. It's actually will worship, which means you're worshiping after man's will instead of God's will. Do it our way instead of God's way. So he says, don't let men force their doctrines on you. So he says, if you're dead to the rudiments of the world, why are you doing what the world says? Touch not, taste not, handle not. These are doctrines of men. Why are you bound by them if you are a Christian? So compromise in one area eventually, I mean, it opens the door to compromise in every area. So go back now to the book of Galatians and let's see the other side of this. Uh, Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Now, when he says evidently set forth, that means set forth with evidence. So again, it was confirmed by the miracles that they saw. But he says, you're foolish, Galatians. You're being bewitched. Uh, Hoodooed is the idea. Someone is deceiving you. They're tricking you that you should not obey the truth. Now, notice they had obeyed the truth to become Christians, but now they're not obeying the truth because they're listening to false teachers. And what does that result in? It will result in their condemnation. Back up in chapter 2, verse 21. This is the verse just before. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? You see, they were listening to this teaching about circumcision, and by by listening to that and believing it and following it, they were frustrating the grace of God. And Paul says, if you could be saved by keeping the law of Moses, then Jesus didn't need to come and die on the cross. We already had the law of Moses. Why would he come and suffer as he did if you could already be saved by that law? And if you can't be saved by that law, why are you trying to go back to it? 
Why are you letting someone tell you that you still need to keep it and bind parts of it on you when you're a Christian? To do that frustrates the grace of Christ. Now look at chapter 5 and verse 1. Here's the solution. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, in the freedom, wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The yoke of bondage is the Old Testament, the law of Moses. Don't become entangled again in that system. Instead, stand fast, firm, strongly, hold your ground rooted and grounded in the liberty that we're given in Christ. He has made us free. Notice verse 2. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. And he means that if you are circumcised as a means of salvation, that's what the Judaizing teachers were, were commanding, that you have to be circumcised to be saved. Paul says, if you believe that and you are circumcised to be saved, then Christ has, has no power in your life. He says that Christ shall profit you nothing. Because see, you've taken the power of salvation away from the blood of Christ and you've put it back in the law of Moses and the circumcision that was a part of that law. You can't bind the law of Moses to the gospel of Christ without robbing Christ of his power. Notice verse 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. This is so important. Paul says, if you bring circumcision out of the law of Moses and make it a part of the new covenant, you have to bring everything in the law of Moses and make it a part of the covenant. Because it's an entire system. It's the law of Moses. You can't pick out circumcision and say that's still binding and not take everything else. And to do that, again, changes the gospel from what Christ preached into something different. Now, understand the principle. Again, this is so important. There are many in the religious world today who tell us that we live under the gospel of Christ and there's the power of forgiveness in the blood of Christ and Jesus is Lord and Master and we follow Him and we do what He says and we obey His will. But... We can have instrumental music in our worship because they did it in the Old Testament. Think about it. They're saying you can take that from the Old Testament, instrumental music in worship, and bind that to the New Testament. And Paul says, if you take one thing, you have to take the whole thing. The simple truth is there's no authority for instrumental music in worship In the New Testament. And if I'm living by the gospel, I can't go to the law of Moses to justify what I want to do today. I have to find my justification, my authority in the gospel. And the minute that I say, well, they did it in the Old Testament, then I also have to burn incense in worship. And I also have to go find me the the proper animal to offer as a sacrifice in worship. And I have to go to Jerusalem three times a year and keep the feast days and do everything else that's a part of the law of Moses. That's exactly what Paul is telling the Galatians. If you hold on to circumcision, you have to hold on to the entire law of Moses. And if you hold on to the law of Moses, you don't have Christ. Look at verse 4. He says, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. We need to understand that principle. You can't mix God's laws. If we want the grace of God, we have to live under the system of grace, which is the gospel, and not add anything to it. From the law of Moses, from the religions of the world, from the doctrines and traditions of men. Listen, it is wrong to bind part of the law of Moses to the gospel of Christ. 
That's exactly what Paul is talking about here. It's just as wrong to bind something that John Calvin taught or Martin Luther taught or anyone else taught, any other human being taught that's different from what the Bible says to bind it to the gospel and think that it's still the gospel of Christ. It's not. It's the gospel of those men because we're teaching and following the traditions of men instead of simply doing what the gospel says. It's another gospel, which is not another, but there's some who trouble you and would pervert, twist, change, alter the gospel. And they do it with their own traditions. If you can't find it in this book, it's not from God. That's the principle. And that's the threat of compromise. When we say, well, it's not that big a deal. Instrumental music and worship, it's not that big a deal. Let's just let's go ahead and go along with it and 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 have peace. You know, among we don't have peace. We don't have unity. We have a perverted gospel. We've robbed ourselves, separated ourselves from the power and the grace of Christ. And that's true with anything that we add to the gospel. And once you take that first step of compromise, the door is wide open. Look at the history of denominationalism. And look how they all started with one small difference from what the gospel said to where they are today. With many denying the inspiration of the Bible, denying the deity of Christ, denying the virgin birth of Christ, denying the miracles of the Bible, denying so many things that the Bible teaches in matters of morality. But it just started with one little compromise. And that's what Paul is warning the churches of Galatia about. Well, number three, there was the threat of division. And we need to understand this. Chapter 2 of Galatians, verse 11 says, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. So think about what happens here. Peter comes to, uh, to this region, comes to um, Antioch, And when he's there, you know, first of all, by himself, he has no problem eating with the Gentile Christians. But when these from Jerusalem come, those who had come up from Jerusalem who are teaching and binding circumcision and the keeping of the law of Moses, what did Peter do? Well, Peter separated himself from the Gentile Christians. He wanted to get along with the Jewish Christians and to fit in with them. And so he compromised. He was wrong. He sinned. So what did Paul do? Paul withstood him to the face. Listen, he says, and and this is important, that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. That's division. The church at Antioch was being divided into a Gentile church and a Jewish church by this false doctrine and those who were compromising with it. And it was such a powerful peer pressure that even Barnabas got caught up in it. And Paul said, we can't have this. And so he went to Peter face to face. And here's what he said. Notice in verse 14, when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? And, And so he says, you're a hypocrite, Peter. You don't keep the law of Moses. Why are you commanding these Gentiles to do it? You have freedom in Christ. You've become a Christian. Why are you trying to bind this on them now? But here's the key. Paul said, when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. They weren't practicing the gospel. They had changed it with their opinion and their tradition into a different gospel. And left unchecked, it would have divided the church. Left unchecked, it would have created a denomination 
And friends, this is where it all comes from. This is where denominationalism begins. Those who stand firmly upon the truth will always, always be divided from those who forsake it. And that's how you grow a denomination. Someone forsakes the truth. Someone else goes along with them. A group follows them and they start a new sect, a new religious group. That's how denominationalism begins. If these Judaizers had their way, a new denomination would have been formed, the Jewish Church of Christ. It would not have been Jewish because they weren't actually keeping the law of Moses. They were also keeping parts of the gospel. And it wouldn't have been the Church of Christ because they had tainted the gospel with the old law. And that's the problem with denominationalism. It claims to still be the same church, but it's not because their doctrine is different from what Jesus taught. And so if Paul hadn't stood up to Peter, there was a real threat very early in the history of the church of the beginning of denominationalism. And thankfully he did, and that didn't happen, and the churches came back together, and there was unity. The false teachers were rejected. But that's the danger. That's the threat, the threat of division. So there was the threat of false doctrine. There was the threat of compromise. There was the threat of division. And then lastly, there was the threat of destruction. The Galatians were well on their way to abandoning God's truth for error. And the end of such action is separation from God and destruction of one's soul. Listen to Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth unto the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. What were they sowing to? What were they planting? It was error. It was false doctrine. It was fleshly. And what would they reap? Destruction. Only those who sow to the Spirit, who remain true to the teaching of the Spirit, the inspired Word of the Holy Spirit, they're the ones who reap everlasting life. And let's close with Galatians 3, verses 10 through 14. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So, if you're going to bind the law of Moses... You have to keep the whole thing. And if you do that, you're under the curse. Okay? Verse 11, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Verse 13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the law, being uh, from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And they were being tempted. They were were threatening to leave that to go back to the law of Moses, a system that would put them under the curse. The, The law of Moses continually said, you need a Savior. And Jesus came. He is the Savior. He's the one who redeems us from the curse. But if we go back to the law of Moses, we remove ourselves from the Savior. We go back to a system that says you're still waiting for a Savior. And So they were headed toward condemnation. The writer of Hebrews says, There remaineth no more sacrifice of sins. For sin. If you leave Christ for the old law, you go back to a system where the sacrifices can't take away your sins. You're lost. You have no hope. And so there was the threat of destruction. So when Paul writes to the churches of Galatia, he warns them about these threats. The threat of false doctrine and, and how it can grow and spread if you don't stand for the truth and know the truth. The threat of compromise, that if you make that first little compromise with error, 
you start down a path that leads to tremendous compromise. The threat of division, that the result of compromise is that the church is torn apart, that one congregation can no longer have fellowship with another, and you have a new religious system that is created that's not from God, and it's not according to His will. That's denominationalism. And then there's the threat of destruction. This is the end of all that. Souls are lost. God does not want His people to be divided He wants them to be united on truth. That's John 17, 17, 1 Corinthians 1, 10, and so many other passages. That's what God wants. But false doctrine leads us astray and causes us to be what God does not want us to be, divided by error by the doctrines and traditions of men. So may we learn from the churches of Galatia learn to imitate their good qualities. And those qualities were they were willing to hear the truth. And Paul tells them uh, what they needed to hear so they can repent and come back to the truth and be faithful to God. May we strive to be a congregation that is faithful and dedicated to the Lord, that we know the truth and that's what we take our stand on. The only way to know the truth is to to be in the book, to read and to study the Bible. And that's each of our responsibility as Christians, as members of the Lord's church. And may we ever be vigilant against error. May we ever be vigilant against compromise. Never compromise in the slightest with the Word of God. That's what we learn from the churches of Galatia. I hope that thinking about these things has been an encouragement to us to look honestly and seriously about division that exists in our world, in the religious world, and to really kind of look back and see where it comes from. And if it's different from the gospel, different from the New Testament, it's not from God. And anyone who preaches that, Paul said, let him be accursed. I don't want to be accursed. I don't want anyone to be accursed. That's why we just try to tell people what the Bible says. Nothing more, nothing less. Hope that you believe it and that you'll obey it and just do what God commands. Not listen to men, what what men tell you or have told you, but just what the Lord says and be obedient to His will. Thank you so much for being here with us and joining us for this study. We appreciate it and glad that you've been a part of it. We look forward to continuing this series and to talk about other congregations that we read about in the New Testament and some great lessons that we can learn from them. So come back with us and join in with us again. Thank you for being here, and we hope to see you soon. 478. Her eyes will take me through.